Welcome to Blocked Ports, a network security podcast bringing you the latest in security and networking news on a variety of computing platforms. Welcome to this fifth episode of Blocked Ports, and thank you for listening. The malicious software known as Stuxnet is gaining attention as more information about its capabilities is discovered. Stuxnet is a worm that has potentially been in circulation since January of this year. According to Symantec data, it is hitting hardest in the Middle East with more than 60% of all infected systems located within the Iranian borders. Stuxnet seeks out Siemens SCADA systems, which are used in large manufacturing and utility plants. SCADA, or S-C-A-D-A, which stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition, is used to protect critical national infrastructure platforms like telecommunications and energy grids. Stuxnet is primarily spread through USB devices. When a Windows user views an infected USB stick on their machine, the code looks for a Siemens system and copies itself to any other USB devices it can find. Critics are chastising Siemens for hard-coding default passwords into their SCADA platform, passwords which have been freely available since 2008 online. Siemens advises operators not to change these default passwords to protect their systems from potential chaos. Symantec offers a detailed analysis of the Stuxnet worm, which you can read by visiting the show notes at blockports.com. Stuxnet has also been targeting recently discovered zero-day vulnerabilities in the Windows shell, allowing the virus to spread without direct user interaction. Microsoft Decision Advisory studying the vulnerability affects all versions of Windows. Attackers exploit the flaw by creating a malicious shortcut file that lures the user to navigate to a USB drive or Windows folder that contains the booby trap file. It is possible to gain complete control over a Windows computer if the attack is successful. The malware renders itself undetectable by installing two drivers, and the flaw can be exploited rather easily. McAfee and other anti-malware vendors are working on a signature to detect the vulnerability, but experts say an effective patch may be difficult to develop due to the way Windows handles shortcuts. Users should keep in mind that due to the recent withdrawal of the official support for Windows XP Service Pack 2 and Windows 2000, a patch for these operating systems is unlikely. The temporary workaround, called Windows Shell Fix-It, is an automated patch that disables the display of all shortcut icons. Microsoft advises administrators to test the workaround before widely deploying it. Critics of this workaround say that it severely handicaps Windows operating systems, and Sophos has released a tool of their own that claims to block any attacks trying to exploit the shortcut vulnerability. Microsoft refuses to endorse the Sophos tool, stating the company does not support any third-party solutions. For links to download the Microsoft Workaround as well as any Sophos tool, please see the show notes at blockports.com. In the wake of attacks stemming from the shortcut exploit, Microsoft announced a new model for responsible disclosure that it claims could provide a more coordinated response to zero-day vulnerabilities. The approach is called Coordinated Vulnerability Disclosure, or CVD, and is similar to Microsoft's Responsible Disclosure Policy. Security researchers are urged to report issues to the vendor or to assert. Both the vendor and researcher would then agree on a timeline to fix the issue. Microsoft's model advocates reporting the vulnerabilities privately to the vendor, giving them opportunity to diagnose and develop workarounds before the information was made public. However, it also states that there may be some instances when it's necessary for public release of information before a patch is available, which is a major change in Microsoft's policy. Debate continues on both sides of the responsible disclosure issue. For links to blogs and more information, please see the show notes at blockports.com. Security researchers continue to pressure companies like Microsoft and Apple to pay a per-vulnerability bounty on bugs found in their products. While Google and Mozilla have upped their bug bounties, Microsoft remains adamant that it will not pay for vulnerability discoveries. Just last week, Google paid researchers $500 each for reporting three high-risk vulnerabilities in the Chrome browser. Google released a new version of the product that addresses these vulnerabilities and encourages all users to update to the current version as soon as possible. Current Chrome users can update by clicking Tools, selecting About Google Chrome, and clicking the Update button. The new version of Chrome is available for download for Windows, Mac OS X, and Linux from the Google website. See the show notes at blockports.com for a direct link.
After an Independence Day attack on Apple's iTunes, the company has banned a Vietnam-based developer from its online application store. The developer allegedly hacked into user accounts making unauthorized purchases of his books and manipulating sales figures to boost his ratings from 50 to 21 in just three weeks. Apple admits that 400 accounts were hacked by the developer, but security experts say such an increase would require thousands of purchases. The experts suggest that potentially many thousands of accounts would have been targeted by automated attacks. Apple maintains that iTunes servers were not compromised and that user account information is not at risk. However, Apple cautions customers to watch for suspicious transactions and recommends that users change account passwords and cancel credit cards if they feel fraudulent purchases were made. Apple is also upping the security on its App Store purchases by increasing the number of times users will be asked to enter their card verification number. A new phishing attack disguises itself as an Adobe PDF Reader update and has been increasing its frequency since mid-June, according to Semantic Hosted Services. The malicious email links to a website advertising fictitious new PDF Reader software. The ads then link to another site that offers free software and other gifts that encourage visitors to pay for membership. Victims are then asked to enter their credit card information on an official-looking page that sports the logos of the top credit card providers and their secure payment systems. Experts say that this site is extremely dangerous because it looks so legitimate and reminds users that any unsolicited email coming from an unknown source should be treated as highly suspicious. Users should never click on links within emails to visit an external site and any site accepting money with a URL that does not begin with HTTPS is not secure and should be avoided. Dell has confirmed on its support forums that several models of its replacement server motherboards were infected with the w32.spybot.worm. The company says that only a small number of the motherboards sent to customers contain the malware and that the maximum potential exposure is less than 1%. The worm took root inside the flash storage area of the replacement boards and Dell notes that it does not reside in the firmware. The worm only affected those customers running Windows operating systems. Dell reports that units with the iDRAC Express or iDRAC Enterprise cards installed cannot be affected. The company contacted affected customers by phone and offered technicians to remove the malware. New replacement stock does not have the malware. Human errors blame for the infection of the motherboards, though Dell has not said how the equipment was infected. The company has taken steps to improve the security process. To read the post from Dell, please visit the show notes at blockports.com. In Linux news, a new stripped-down Ubuntu distribution has been released. This distribution is designed specifically for reverse engineering malware. The OS is called Remnux, R-E-M-N-U-X, and includes a variety of popular malware analysis, network monitoring, and memory forensic tools to take apart malicious code. Remnux is distributed as a VMware virtual machine that can be booted through several VMware products or through X Windows. The creator, Lenny Zelster, is an expert on malware reverse engineering and hopes that this collection of tools will be a good starting point for people who are not Linux experts. For more information on Remnux, including a download link, please see the show notes at blockports.com. The Russian government is hoping to launch a national operating system for its computers that is based almost entirely on the Linux operating system. The operating system is part of a program called Information Society, which Moscow plans to implement in September. With the program could come a state email system as early as next year, as well as a national search engine. A WPA2 vulnerability was discovered last week by a senior wireless security researcher at Airtight Networks. The researcher found a hack for encrypted wireless networks that does not require an encryption key. Hole 196, as it is being called, is a documented but little-known vulnerability, according to the vendor. Authorized users can bypass private key encryption and authentication through Hole 196, which, according to airtight experts, leaves networks vulnerable to insider threats from disgruntled employees or cyber spies. The vulnerability is easy to exploit and can only be detected by monitoring over-air network traffic, causing concern for those organizations relying on the strong encryption 
and authentication capabilities of WPA2. Attackers must be internal, and because Hole 196 is written into the standard, a patch is not anticipated. For a link to the Airtight Network's press release detailing Hole 196, please see the show notes at blockcourts.com. Google's data collection process is being questioned by more than 30 states in an investigation led by Connecticut attorney Richard Blumenthal. Google insists they did nothing illegal by inadvertently collecting 600 gigabytes of private data from unsecured networks over the last three years. The issue stemmed from the Google Map Street View feature. Vehicles take photographs of street layouts in all directions to give web users a 360-degree view of the mapped area. Google recently revealed that these vehicles were also equipped to detect Wi-Fi access points through which the company had gathered large amounts of emails, passwords, and other personal data from unsecured networks. The states included in the probe claimed that testing the feature's software before use would have uncovered any glitches that allowed for the collection of data. The investigation will look into whether federal and state laws need updating as a preventative measure. Similar investigations are taking place in Germany, Australia, Spain, and France. As of July of this year, websites accepting credit card payments must be compliant with both the PCI DSS and the PA DSS, or Payment Application Data Security Standard. The PA DSS applies to products that are distributed as applications, including shopping cart programs and e-commerce solutions. People can purchase the applications, then do whatever they wish with them. To be fully PCI compliant with the new PA DSS, Level 4 merchants must be running compliant applications on their site, for example, their shopping cart software. The web host must also be PCI compliant by using properly encrypted networks, performing regular system scans, and regularly updating their antivirus software. For more information about the PA DSS, please see the show notes at blockports.com. The PCI Security Standards Council announced additional dates for Internal Security Assessor, or ISA, training sessions last month. The three-day course will be offered providing a PCI DSS training and certification for internal assessment staff at merchants, acquiring banks, and processors. Attendees will receive technical instruction on how to validate and maintain ongoing PCI compliance within their organizations. ISA certifications are renewed annually and are valid while the certified individuals remains at the company that sponsored their attendance at the training. ISA training attendees must be full-time employees of their company. For more information on the ISA training, including registration information for the upcoming sessions, please see the show notes at blockports.com. Thank you for listening. Blocked Ports is brought to you by Ron McCarty, a freelance writer and consultant specializing in systems, network, and information security. Ron is the founder and CEO of Your NetGuard, an IT services company located in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Oh.